Welcome to Still Growing in Grace, a program dedicated to inspiring joy, giving hope, and delighting in grace. I'm Mike Zenker, and I'll be sharing with you a message of hope that will expand your understanding of God's love and amazing grace. God already deeply loves you, totally accepts you, and really, really likes you. Growing in Grace Ministries Canada and Hope Fellowship, your community church, invite you to enjoy today's program as we dig deeper into what it means to be still growing in grace. Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to Still Growing in Grace. I'm glad you took time to join me today. I've got a treat, uh, a conversation from a couple years ago uh, with David Hayward, known as the Naked Pastor. Um, if you haven't seen his cartoons yet, look them up. Uh, if you're at all on the journey of relearning or questioning the answers that have been given to us uh, throughout our, our upbringing in church, David kind of does his questioning through cartoons, and it does it in a powerful way. Um, I, I think you're going to really, really, really enjoy this. So let's dig right into this conversation. Now, when I had this conversation with him, um, I was dealing with the topic of COVID stress because people are going crazy. People were having a really hard time with uh, COVID restrictions. Um, you had conspiracy theorists that were kind of creating a whole new level of fear they're still there but still um this conversation is from back then but the value of what we talk about i think is still gonna be really really good so dig in to this conversation i'll be watching with you comment uh as we watch um because i'm watching with you i haven't i haven't seen this for two years so i'm really eager to hear this conversation again and uh let's just dive right in here we go Honey. all right uh, hello everyone it looks like we are live everywhere this is uh mike zenker with still growing in grace and i'm with david hayward uh known as the naked pastor which is a hilarious cheeky uh uh title <laughs> uh, oh that was a pun sorry so david uh introduce yourself tell us where you're from hi yeah hi mike and thanks for having me on your show hello everybody out there um uh, yeah, my name's David Hayward, but uh, most people know me not by David Hayward, but by Naked Pastor um, as a cartoonist and a writer and, you know, all kinds of things. Um, I live in near St. John, New Brunswick, in a little town called Quispam Sis, New Brunswick. And um, I'm married. I have, we have three grown children. And um, I basically do what I do online. Um, I, I was a, a minister. I was a pastor for about 30 years. Wow. But I left the ministry in um, 2010. So there's hope for me. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I'm yeah, 30 years this hope. year. <laughs> there's always hope. I hung in there for, th you know, a good 30 years. And, um, and then uh, from there, I, I taught in university for a couple of years. And then, uh, then I decided to try to make a go of naked pastor full time. And it works. So that's what I'm doing now. Wow. Yeah, I love, I've been following your art for a while. Um, in fact, did the one you put up today was that brand new today? Yeah, I drew that today. Okay, the this dog. is this this is the one right here. So yeah. <laughs> those that are watching, you can see. Um, I actually want to print this and bring it down to the pet store in my town because they'll love this. <laughs> We're gonna get your name out there, David. <laughs> That's cool. I love that. You know. <laughs> Um, what, what launched your, uh, cartoons? Because I think this, com again, this is going to be a conversation. I have two, two things I want to hear about, uh, today. One, um, how do we deal with COVID-19 stress and how, uh, and guarding our thoughts and staying positive, especially as believers, whether you call yourself a Christian or not, but mm. this is, this is for all of us in renewing our mind or being focused and intentional and, and not getting sucked into the negativity, but then your, your journey of faith, there are others that are uh, walking the same mm -hmm. path as you or are wanting to, or have questions. And when you hear somebody else being honest about their journey, it gives you permission to ask your own questions. Yeah. Yeah, totally. So what, what launched all this? Okay. Well, my cartoons, um, I've been doing cartoons now since about 2005. Now, before then, I've always drawn and I know I've always painted. I've been an artist for my whole life as far back as I can remember. My dad was an artist. He painted and I just, you know, I would draw things all the time. But um, I started my blog in about 2004 or five or something. But one day I decided to 
like I love a good cartoon. And there was a couple cartoonists I, I was uh, following. And I thought, you know what, why don't I try to draw a cartoon, give myself, I'll try to draw a cartoon every day, see how it goes. I thought I'd last a couple of weeks. Here I am going 15 years later, <laughs> uh, drawing a cartoon pretty much nearly every day. Wow. Um, unless I'm, I don't feel like it or we're busy or something comes up or I can't think of anything. Uh, but um, what do you call it when it's uh, if you can't write, it's a writer's block, but if you're a cartoonist, what's it called? <laughs> artist block, artist okay. block, creativity <laughs> block, whatever. Um, but it happens. And, um, but um, I just found my traffic and audience started to go up after I did cartoons. Like people were drawn to them. Oops. Oh, that's a pun. Um, but they, they, uh, they just have a way of communicating a lot in just a second or two. Yep. Um, you know, by the time, you know, you can see my cartoon in one or two seconds and, and the message is delivered rather than having to read a thousand word blog post. Yep. And so I just found a really effective way to communicate. Yeah. You're the shortcut King. Yeah. It's shortcut. It bypasses the, you know, rational intellect. Uh, uh, it, uh, hits your heart, um, go straight for the jugular. Sometimes it can be offensive or funny or, you know, um, educational or controversial or whatever. And, uh, it just, I just found them really, really effective. So I have fun doing it and I love, I love doing it, but also, um, I, f I find them just really practically effective at communicating what I want to communicate. So, um, yeah, so I've been doing them now for 15 years. So I noticed that uh, you seem, if, if somebody takes a look at your cartoons and misjudges it, the first mis misjudgment, I think, is that you're taking pot shots at the church or God. Mm -hmm. What do you say to that? Because I don't think you are, but mm -hmm. I can see how people could see that on the front end, especially religious right. folks would feel offended. Yeah. What, so, what are you trying to do? Yeah. So I'm, I'm very, um, I'm, I try to be very clear. Uh, but it's impossible to say every time I post a cartoon <laughs> um, that like I actually have a lot of appreciation for the church and the church did a great deal for me. Uh, it was an amazing, an, an amazing place. That's where I experienced true community at times. Uh, I also experienced a lot of hurt, but um, you know, mm -hmm. it was just, well, uh, if you're a pastor for 30 years, of course yeah. you're going to experience hurt. Yeah. And uh I, I, I just think the church's greatest asset is its ability to provide community. And when it works, it's awesome. But when it doesn't work, it's terrible. Yeah. And so I see, I see very few, it's kind of rare to see really healthy functional community happening in churches. And it's discouraging to me. Um, I see a lot of, power and control and hierarchy and patriarchy and yep. um, sexism and uh, uh, homophobia and, you know, xenophobia, all kinds of stuff. Yep. And um, it a lot just, of fear. a lot of fear. And so I criticize what um, the, the church's abuse of its identity. So, so maybe it's not so much criticizing as it is calling it out. Calling right. it out. Yeah. I think that's better. Like I can, people, I can hear people say, well, we shouldn't be criticizing, you know, well, hang on. <laughs> Jesus sure called yeah. out stuff. He didn't criticize. He called it out and said, this is not yeah. the plan. This yeah, is not I'm how you were designed. I'm not, you know, it, it's funny when I was in the church, people are, would say to me, you shouldn't bite the hand that feeds you. <laughs> and then, now that I've left the church, people are saying you have no right to criticize something you're not wow. a part of. Wow. And so, um, but I, I was there. I, I did my best for my whole life. You know, I was, I was a pastor for 30 years, but I also was in the church longer than that. And um, so I, you know, the, I served the church for a long time and I've seen the inside and the out of what goes on. I've seen the underbelly. I've seen behind the curtain and uh, I know what goes on there. And um, you know, when it works, it works and it's powerful. When it doesn't work, it's really destructive and hurts a yeah. lot of people. So that's why I, as you say, call out the church and try to um, challenge it to live up to its calling. You know, mm -hmm. what I have uh, enjoyed about your cartoons, especially on Facebook, um, 
I have a lot of unchurched friends who believe in God. They just don't believe in the system. Mm -hmm. And so when those cartoons come up, um, they're calling out what they're seeing. Like mm -hmm. you're, you're drawing truth as in that's the very reason why I don't go to church. Or, that's the very reason I don't believe in God um, mm -hmm. because God isn't the issue. It's the rep misrepresentation of who he is. Mm -hmm. And I personally, I've been on a deconstruction, reconstruction journey for a while. Brad Jerzyk last week um, used the term, uh, call it a renovation. And so even on the title of today's program, I put in deconstruction, re uh, reconstruction, the renovation of our faith. Mm -hmm. um, because I know your cartoons are about the whole deconstruction, reconstruction. Uh, that, that's what I'm well, noticing. Yeah, so I, I, I want to I wanna be clear that... Uh, I, I, I want to see the church work. Yeah. The real when, church. When it does, when it does live up to its calling, yep. it's powerful. Nothing can beat it. And, um, you know, there's a lot of crazy, silly, stupid, um, destructive, uh, concepts about God and Christ and the Holy yeah. Spirit and, you know, um, things like that, that I, I call out, uh, because, um, I think if, if we continue to challenge ourselves to think outside the box and to grow and to progress in our, in our thinking, to be transformed uh, by the renewing of our mind, then um, I think we can see powerful things happen in our communities and, and in the world. But as long as we stay dogmatic and fundamentalist, then mm. um, it's just going to keep dividing us. So what, what would you say is one of the biggest problems uh, in the traditional church that is preventing people from seeing a more hope-filled perspective? Well, there's a lot, but yes, there's a lot, but um, see, I don't have a problem with churches having buildings or having clergy or raising money or, you know, paying staff or, um, you know, having worship bands and, having smoke and mirrors <laughs> and literally dry, dry ice and lights and all, all, that, all that stuff is, yeah. uh, you know, just secondary for me. The issue is the quality of relationship and, mm -hmm. and the, and uh, n not the abuse of power. So what, this is what I see. Churches don't like chaos. Uh, but I've seen that when people are allowed to be free, um, when they are allowed to be authentic, yep. uh, it creates for powerful growth and powerful community, uh, the quality of community. For me, if a church is struggling with this question, this has always been for me the question. How can I be free without violating your freedom? Uh. If, if a church can struggle with that question, how can we enable people to be free, empower people to be free, mm -hmm while at the same time not violating the freedom of others. If we can figure that out. And be so loving about it. Wife, it's the same with my wife and I. How can I be totally authentically me without hurting her? And, and how can she authentically be herself without hurting me? How can we grow into fully independent quality human beings while staying together in a quality, mm. authentic relationship? And if a church can struggle with that, I think it's on its way to being a really healthy community. Yeah. Yeah. yeah we, w my church hasn't arrived. <laughs> We've been unlearning a lot. But it's but not arriving though. That's my no. point. My point yeah. is, is struggling with that issue. If you, yep. if a church is struggling with that issue, no church has arrived. There's no perfect church. There's only perfect moments. Do you know what, do you know what my church did when I got my, when I, my wife found this ad for my job, she, it said perfect church seeks perfect pastor. That was the title of the ad, dot, 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 just kidding. But on and on it went. Wow. So that's how, they, that's how they launched it. And so <laughs> anyway, no. that's funny. It's really funny. No, there's no, there's no perfect church unless they're all perfect. You know, there's a, you know I've, I've been a part, I, and I know there's some churches out there that really strive to be authentic and, and, mm -hmm. and create the, an environment of freedom for its members and for the community. And they're, they're really exciting to be a part of that community. Uh, and they do not claim to be perfect. In fact, that would be the death of it. You have to, it's an experiment mm -hmm. that you conduct every single day.
Yeah, that's cool. I like that. Okay, I'm going to run to a, the a initial topic today. Um, okay. Given your background and given uh, your lens of being part of the church world, so you know what they think like, mm-hmm. and you're, uh, you're obviously observing what's going on online from people, uh, mm-hmm. believers on left and right sides and extreme left, extreme right. Um, how would you, have you had a chance to talk to people about how to address the negative stress in the media, negative stress with COVID-19, um, how to approach it, how to de-stress from it? Have, has that been a conversation with you? Oh my goodness. Yeah. Yeah. Every day. Okay. Every day. Um, yeah. Uh, and the number one thing I tell people is um, just be gracious with yourself. Mm. <laughs> We're in the middle of a pandemic. <laughs> so things aren't nor- normal. And don't expect life to be normal. And it's okay to be down and feel unproductive and be unproductive and uh, to be drained and maybe depressed and worried and anxious. So all those things are human, natural human responses and coping mechanisms for for crises and trauma, which we're in the middle of. Like we're in the middle of a crisis. We're in the middle of traumatizing events. And, um, you know, so that's the first thing I tell people is, hey, just just be gracious with yourself. Mm -hmm. Then... Do, just focus on the small things. And that's, you know, that's what I try to do um, and encourage others to do the same. Don't, you know, I, I, I remember at the beginning, people, were, I'm going to take this opportunity to write that book I've been wanting to write. You know? <laughs> and it's like, they just can't seem to get, get it done because there's, they're, they're just overwhelmed. And, and now they're beating themselves up because they had they this goal. Yep. Double guilt. Yeah. Yeah. And, and so I'm just like, Hey, like just, relax um you know and that's one of the things that uh, my wife and i have discovered uh during this my wife's a nurse by the way and she works in a palliative care facility and so we're very extremely cautious about the whole quarantining and distancing and wearing a mask and you know hand sanitizer the whole bit like we're very 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 cautious and our bubbles are very small so we're uh but one thing that we've learned is, you know, get offline. Uh, we mm-hmm. live across the road from a river. We go down with our beach chairs and sit on the river, you know, maybe have a, have a glass of wine, watching the boats go by uh, and just talk or read or nothing, you know? And, and it's, just, it's just those little things. You know, we've always been taught, you need to be before you do. Well, mm-hmm. This is this is something that we're almost being forced to learn is just how to be. Mm-hmm. And uh, for a lot of people, though, there's a lot of guilt and shame associated with it, that they're not accomplishing something or building something or creating something or finishing something. So uh, mm-hmm. I just I just help people just relax, you know, be just be, you know, and this is a time to be. Mm-hmm. Do you think this pandemic is... Um bringing to the surface undealt with issues in people's lives because oh. now we've been, we've been able to distract ourselves from facing any issues by staying busy. And now we're having to almost stop and pause. Right. I've, I've heard some people call this pandemic, the great pause. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, for sure. Um, yeah. I've um, been writing a lot more in my journal and uh, which I've done for decades now. And, uh, and then there's little things that I'll, I'll do as well. Like get, just get offline. Like I'll, I, I get my news source mostly from Twitter. So, um, I, uh, and what, what I consider, um, you know, reputable sources and, uh, I'll just, I'll just get off Twitter now. And because I noticed a real big change in my mental health. After I, uh, after 2016 happened and um, since then, and just me being overwhelmed with news and information. And that was very depressing to me, very concerning to me. And I noticed a real big change in my mental health, my emotional health. And so I, I find, you know, the, yeah, the, the, the great pause is just a pause um, getting information like there's so much information information overload for sure so i'll yeah. just i'll just get offline for like 
many hours, if not half the day, you know, and uh, well, if I want to find out what's happening in the world, I scroll quickly through Twitter. I find out very quickly what's happening. Then I get back off and um, I don't inundate my mind with all this information. You know, uh, I just heard, um, I think this morning, I think the new count for COVID deaths in the United States alone is 180. Wow. 5,000 people. That's a lot of people who are not, who have died around us. You know, yeah. I'm in Canada, you're in Canada, but you know, my wife's American. We have a lot of friends in the States and a lot of my followers are in the States. That's traumatizing, you know, to lose, you know, I think soon it's going to be a quarter million. If it's not already, we don't even know the real figures. And that's, that should be traumatizing to any normal person. And, um, you know, so we're in the middle of a, a huge crisis and to be experiencing trauma is to be understood and normal. I think Paul Young, two weeks ago, he was saying that six of his wife's side of the family, um, family members have COVID and are, are quite sick yeah. and just having a really hard time. Like it's, this is a real thing. It's not a fake news. It's not a fake virus. It's no, I have friends in the States and every... I think everyone I know knows somebody in their family or close to them who have COVID or have died of COVID already. So yeah. it's a, uh, it's a, it's a big deal. You know, I have a lot of family in the States as well. And um, it's, it's very scary. And uh, you know, there was a lot of stress connected with that too, like uh, with my wife and um, uh, just us being super careful uh, the last thing she would want to do is carry COVID into the palliative care facility. Yes. And, um, you know, it, it's just a lot of anxiety, a lot of stress associated with it. So, you know, we just practice the very, very simple things like just being still, just not feeling the pressure to do anything and uh, just understanding ourselves and being gracious with ourselves. I think that goes a long way. And then not, not to feel ashamed about it. You know? mm -hmm. Especially those who are busy, busy, you know, you feel bad for taking a rest, <laughs> you know, cause yeah. you're used to always go, 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 go. Right. Know? Right. Um, but I yeah. like the advice of uh, removing yourself from uh, like disconnect from media, uh, mm -hmm. internet, uh, and just have quiet time. I was on a boat last night for the first time in a number of years. Somebody took me on their motorboat and went fishing. Nice. I was like, I didn't know I needed that. Yeah. And so when I was done, it's like, huh dang yeah. i gotta i need to do this a little bit more <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know because i'm yeah. so trying to react to all the stuff that's going on and with my world i've got uh, you know a couple of jobs trying to make sure i make ends meet is my job gonna last oh no so i have all these fears playing out in my head and i play this game and i just i'm preaching through a series on how to how to walk through the stress and i gotta listen to my own messages you know <laughs> you yeah. know the be still was a big one be loved was a big one you know beloved is really be loved do you know you're loved do you know your identity rest in that peace and mm -hmm. This is a great time to ponder the somebody loving and doling on you, you know. But mm -hmm. yeah, I don't know. It's it's been it's been a it's been a wild time for sure. And then trying to strategize, you know, our, our church is looking at reopening in person services in uh, late September. And what does that mean? Well, there's a whole new level of stress and work connected to that. Yeah, you know. Yeah. So it, it's it's unique, and I think very we're gonna extreme, be, very extreme and unusual times. Yep. And, we, and with my leadership team and people in my church, we've got opinions that are very oh, from all over. Well, you know what? Everybody's overblowing this or we don't have to wear masks or we, you know, all these different expressions. And what I've had to learn is have everyone at least acknowledge that there are other perspectives that we may totally disagree with, but obviously look at that one person. Do, are they intelligent? Do you trust them? Yes. And, but they hold a different belief. Okay. Then don't get mad at them. You know, like this is, this is about relationship. You're talking about healthy communities. I think the more conversations of giving permission for varied beliefs allows for better relationships because then you have greater discussions without having to be right. Because I, I have a hunch. Churchianity is more about being more right than other people than it is even about Christ. And yeah. that's, that's scary. Yeah, so I have an online community called The Lasting Supper that I launched in 2012 for people who are deconstructing. And um, it's come in very handy during this 
the COVID crisis when, you know, a lot of them have already left the church, but some hadn't. And now, you know, it's an online community. So yeah. there's a couple of hundred members there. And uh, one, uh, we just have a value system in place that people, we, we encourage them to catch on to as quickly as possible. There's a great wide diversity of people there, anything from church going believers to atheists. Mm -hmm. Uh, who, who used to be believers and now are atheists and left the church and will never go back, et cetera. Yep. And everybody in between. And, and it's a wonderful, dynamic, energetic, loving community, supportive, but we, it's only because we respect one another and we refuse to argue. Mm, or love it. So, and one of the analogies I use to help people try to understand how we do things is the potluck supper, which most churches know about, uh, where you bring something to the potluck and you put it on the long table or whatever. And when you go up to fill your plate, you, you move along. If you see something you like, you put it on your plate. If you see something you like, you don't put it on your plate, but you don't say anything about it. <laughs> Ew, who made this? This is disgusting. Yeah, who <laughs> well, then I'm gluten intolerant or whatever. <laughs> you just keep moving. You don't yep. say anything. You don't like it. You don't take it. If you can't really eat, good you put it on your plate. If you do like it, you put it on your plate. No comment, right? Um, mm -hmm. and, um, and if you take something and nobody eats it, you don't say, why didn't anybody eat my stuff? You ungrateful, but you know, whatever. You just <laughs> quietly take your dish home and say, I won't take that again. Yes. And, and so that's the way we treat it at the Lasting Supper is if, if somebody says something you don't agree with, just move on. Don't start a fight. Yeah. And uh, you just say, well, that's their opinion. It's not mine, but I'm not going to, you know, it, this isn't the place to debate. This isn't the place to argue because I've learned debate and argument are absolutely useless, a complete waste of time. And, and if we want to enjoy the quality of community, if you want to, if you want to debate, politics or health mm. measures or theology there are places for that yep but not here here we're learning how to uh vent honestly what we're going through in our deconstruction mm -hmm. and listen without judgment and and that's it so deconstruction how would you define that because that's the other topic i wanted to get into because that one's dear to me um yeah. How would you, what, what is deconstruction for somebody that's not heard the term or what's a healthy way to understand that? Deconstruction. Well, I actually, I, I need, I need to look back at my records, but I think I'm the first one who used that in reference to uh, changing your beliefs. Okay. It's originally a, a term, a philosophical term. Um, Derrida um, is the one who invented the term deconstruction uh, but I'm, I took the term because I was studying it at the time. I thought, mm, this sounds like, you know, a good way to explain when our beliefs crumble mm -hmm. and erode and fall apart. And it usually comes and, to crisis, right? Yeah, it's definitely a crisis. Absolutely. And, and so I call it deconstruction, where instead of building up, it, it's unbuilt mm -hmm. <laughs> and things fall apart. And uh, so... Uh, that's what I call deconstruction is when your beliefs change. Yep. And I mean, in a ra kind of radical way. And uh, when they start to erode and slip away and lose meaning for you, for, for most people, if not all, that's a very traumatizing experience. Okay. So trigger. <laughs> um, I've been discussing deconstruction with a lot of people for the last couple of years now. And this COVID crisis, you add the anxiety of deconstructing uh, some pretty big pillars of faith in your life. Now you've got this COVID crisis and all this extra crisis hitting you. Um, I think those that are in a deconstruction journey are even more anxious or traumatized because of all this. Because now they've just, they're, they're seeing that everything can be questioned. Now they're questioning the news this is a very vicious spin cycle in my mind. Well, the common thing between those two, though, is uh, the necessity to think for ourselves mm. rather than Spoon believing what we've been conditioned to believe or believing yep. whatever we're told. 
Yep. yep. So we need to we need to learn how to be discerning. I think that's the one gift of the spirit that is completely <laughs> lacking. But I want the other <laughs> gifts. I want the more exciting ones. <laughs> Discernment, man. I mean, <laughs> where is it? Discernment, you know. So um, I I think that's what the common thread is: uh, the mm-hmm. necessity to become discerning and learn to think for yourself. Uh, so you know, I know I was conditioned in what to believe in growing up. And we all were. Christian. And yeah, no matter who you are, no matter what religion or non-religion, even atheist friends I know, I, I know atheists who are deconstructing from their atheism upbringing um, in order to become spiritual, more mm-hmm. spiritual, uh, more spiritually aware. So it, it goes both ways. So it's, de- it's basically a, a unconditioning a okay, deep yeah, yeah. of your belief system. That yeah. that's good, but that's not the goal. Is to just strip it down, right? Like I'm, I hear people um, are afraid of deconstruction because it lends the to the idea that it means nothing is left when you're done. You're destroying. It's like you're deconstructing a cabin to nothing. So there's nothing left. But that's not the point of deconstruction, is it? Well. This is this is where I part company with a lot of people, okay? Uh, because I actually don't encourage reconstruction, okay? So help me, under, help me understand because okay, I'll, I think I'll, I'll, I know I'll, what you mean, but I'm, I really want to hear your heart on this because my oh, world, the people that I'm connected to, this conversation is going to be really important. Yeah. Um, so I'm in a house here. I bought. And it was a, it was basically because we're on a river. It's used to be an old cottage and it was all chopped up in little rooms. I love open concept. So uh, what I did was I, myself, I took all the walls down, put up posts and beams and opened it all up. Wow. And so it's open concept. Now the kitchen, living room, dining room, it's all one big happy space. Um, and I like space and I like openness and I like that freedom. So, when we're deconstructing our conditioning, what we've been conditioned to believe, why the anxiety about replacing something that was, I don't like to use the word false because that means that it was all a lie. I don't mean it was all a lie. It means, it it, it just means it doesn't work anymore. Mm. Um, Why, why that anxiety to build something back up again? So I encourage people (laughs) not to, not to, rebuild something right at least right away like i know a lot of people they experience a, a lot of anxiety around their yep. construction they're no longer believing in the same things and they immediately jump into yoga yep. buddhism yep. atheism um crystals new age stuff whatever because they need a container they yeah. feel they need some kind of label to describe where they're at i'm anti-label i don't believe in wearing labels sometimes they're handy Sometimes they're useful. Sometimes they're practical. But I don't need the label. You need the label to understand. You think you need the label. I need the label on myself so you can read what my contents are. I don't need that label. A rela- a relationship, that. true relationship doesn't require label. No, that's but true. Nobody, well, nobody, want, nobody wants to take the time for a relationship. They want the label so they can read your mind and judge you instantly. So my, my point about not reconstructing is – clearing out all it's like um it's like uh weeding a garden i use this analogy too it's like preparing a garden let's say you have a tomato plant and you plant the seed you you clear the stones you clear the stump you break up the ground you you uh add in mulch or you add in not mulch um compost fertilizer you plant the seed you water you wait you keep weeding keep it clear, keep, try to keep the birds away, try to keep the deer away, try to keep the rabbits away. You hope, hopefully it gets sun, you keep nourishing it, nourishing it, and eventually the tomato will grow. It's the same with deconstruction. Like a, 99% of the work is just getting stuff out of the way. And then once all the stuff's out of the way, the stones, the stumps, the weeds, the birds, the deer, the rabbit, all this stuff, it'll grow. Mm-hmm. Who you are to be will, will grow naturally without force. And, I like and that. so that's what I encourage. It's just, it's let, just, let God grow you. Let, let it, let be. it all go. 
let it all go. Yeah. And, and that's like a Disney song, isn't it? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> well, yeah, no, it's kind of, I think it's frozen. Huh? Let it, it is. <laughs> let yeah. it go. Let it go. Yeah. <laughs> well, let it go. Like, a, like my daughter always says, like, like a balloon, let it go. Just as a, go. as a pastor, um, that was really hard for me. Uh, in fact, uh, I was telling you just briefly before we began, but about 20 years ago, I started discovering my identity in Christ, so to speak. Mm-hmm. And I, uh, number one, I didn't know I was actually forgiven. I thought I had to beg for my forgiveness and it was up to me to stay forgiven up, you know, by yeah. how I repented and prayed. And I'm a, I'm a senior pastor of a church and I'm just coercing what everybody else is saying too. But when I discovered I, I was completely forgiven a weird sense of freedom hit that I could never have experienced. Mm-hmm. And it, I didn't try to figure it out anymore. I didn't try to fit the other stuff into my, into my box, but I did as a pastor because pastors have to be prepared to give an answer because that's our job. Um, I had to understand all these other categories and I went searching like crazy, trying to figure out who God is better. And, and God kind of stopped me six months later and says, so how's it going? How are you doing on your own there, eh? You know, you're coming up with some good answers, aren't you? No, I'm not. Well, stop trying. Let yeah. me reveal as the time goes. Don't try to help me out. I don't need your help. And right. I hear that from your plant idea of just just be be who you are. You know, the, the idea of letting go of all these beliefs. If it's true, it's it's going to stick. If it's not true, it'll fizzle away. And we got to be okay with that. That's scary. So it, it's, a, a, it's a mystical kind of approach. To I like that word. Where you're, where you're rather than living through the filter of your beliefs, yep. receiving uh, experience through the filter of belief. Is this wrong? Is this right? Is this pure? Is this impure? Is this secular? Is this sacred? Mm-hmm. Is this holy? Is this unholy? You know, instead of all that. And, and also instead of relating to the world, through the filter of beliefs, who can I love? Who should I not love? Who should I reject? Who should I allow in the church? Who should we not allow in the church? Who is, who is pure? Who is, you know, all this stuff. We live directly, wow. immediately with that, with love. And, and, um, and th- then you, you realize that beliefs play an entirely different role um, when you live, when you live directly. It's, it's kind of like in a loving relationship, like, like with Lisa and I, I, I don't need to, uh, um, I don't need to, I don't need information. Hmm. Uh, I don't need data. I don't need beliefs about her in order to enjoy her or for her to enjoy me. It's immediate. That love that we share is immediate. The experience is immediate without the filter of, of uh, words and language and everything. Right. So, that, yep. uh, and the same goes with uh, our spiritual lives. I think we can live that authentically, that directly with that immediacy mm. and spontaneity. Um, and, and so letting all these beliefs go, it's a, it's a, it's a mystical kind of approach to life and it's scary at first, but once you get the hang of it, then <clears throat> there's nothing more beautiful. But what I've noticed, and I love that uh, out in the East, uh, the Eastern world, they're used to mystical. That's normal. The, the Eastern church is more mystical than the Western. Western church, Western thinking seems to be locked up into cubby holes and boxes of clear, concise, here's the doctrine, there we go. Don't mess with that box. And if, uh, if you have the box, you don't have to think. You don't have to do anything. You don't have to respond because I've got my box and the box tells me what to believe. So there isn't really faith required. Um, yeah. has, has that concept uh, hit you ever, or have you looked into Eastern, um, oh, yeah, no. Western oh, yeah. dualism? Yeah. Like, um, I've, uh, I've done a lot of reading in Eastern stuff and, and they have their issues like yep. the, uh, any philosophy, any religion, any approach, uh, to life, uh, has issues. That's why, mm-hmm. that's why I, I call these things all experiments mm-hmm. or, suggestions or it's like the scientific community um we were talking about quantum physics earlier you mentioned somebody who's into quantum physics i love reading physics uh i i can't believe i'm saying that 
<laughs> I sucked in science and math and so on. But um, uh, the quantum physics world is, is fascinating. And in the world of science, they have a, a sort of a, a code of ethic that says everything must be falsifiable. In other words, whatever statement we make, we need to accept the fact that it could be wrong. Is no. everything falsifiable? Everything's falsifiable, <laughs> and and otherwise, research stops. And we see that happening in the theological world. Oh the yeah. World. If we we make a statement, it's not falsifiable. It's absolutely true. Because God told you, right? Stops. Yeah. Investigation stops. Mm -hmm. Study stops. Research stops. Changing our mind stops. Change stops. So uh, that's why I I think everything needs to be handled with open open hands i love that i uh was listening to a uh doctor medical doctor who was teaching his name is bruce walkup i don't know if you ever heard of him he's from australia he's connected to baxter kruger have you heard of baxter yes uh -huh. yeah so this is this is his one of his australian guys uh -huh. and he was teaching and talking about um how the early church had there's two categories the eastern church had one long strain and they they didn't divorce science but the um the uh, other the early church the the ones that came to constantine and what he what he did and augustine came in and blah 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 that whole uh, Western mindset created a sense of dualism and, and separation theology came in like you wouldn't believe. They divorced science. Um, and by the time I got done realizing how I have been conditioned by my world in my country, in my Western right. thinking, um, I knew what I was learning about God being better than I thought, uh, the angry God concept. Um, I was wrestling with that. I, I knew what I was hearing from certain people was true, but why was, was I having a hard time? When I listened to Bruce teach that, he, it's a series on, on YouTube called What is the Gospel? And um, I realized that I thought there was a wall in front of me stopping me from seeing something really important mm -hmm. until I realized there wasn't a wall in front of me. I was in the wall, the Western wall of conditioned thinking that did not allow me to see another perspective. Mm -hmm. And when I realized that, I wept. I realized, oh my goodness, I have so much more to learn. My, my tight-fisted theology is now open-handed. Father, put in whatever it needs to go in, take out whatever. You know, it's, uh, it's out of my control. What else am I going to learn? And it's going to be scary because I'm going to start to believe things I didn't think were true and, I'm, and vice versa. So it, it's really scary just giving in and letting the Holy Spirit be your teacher instead of man. Well, it's... It's, it's like Galileo, right, who um, his scientific uh, discoveries were uh, challenging the theology of the church mm -hmm. and were rejected because, um, you know, because Galileo was decentralizing uh, the earth and man, uh, generic man. Um, and, and it was just too upsetting for the church to accept. And yeah. so, and that, that's still happening today all the time. Yeah. Um, Copernicus and so on the Copernican revolution is it's always happening where, um, we refuse to change our minds because it, it decentralizes something that is central to us. So, and I, you know, I'm, there's something I tried to do when I was a preacher was preach open-handedly. So that doesn't mean like I, I preach away and then at the end I say, or whatever. <laughs> it's not like that. It's more like, here's what I'm thinking. Yeah. Here's what I'm sensing. They're invite, uh, you're inviting them into your thoughts. Right. And I, I, I would literally be on the same level with them and yeah. say, what are you guys thinking? Um, what, what, were your, what are your thoughts? It was very back and forth discussion, question and answer, because um, I didn't want to... Uh, I didn't want to be their guru and I knew that we were on a, a journey together to understand. And um, so if we were truly an authentic community, we all contribute to our mm. health. Absolutely. Yeah. I like that. Mm. Wow. So deconstruction, um, where have you seen the greatest um, categories of deconstruction where people are saying, Hey, this is where I'm having a hard time. And I'll, I'll lead in with this. Uh, a number of years ago, I think it was five years ago, I heard Paul Young at a conference 
him and Baxter were there and they were there had the stool in the middle of the of the um of the stage and the one side there was three chairs trinity and then they had the singular angry god over on the other side but the stool was in the middle and paul made a funny joke he said atheists um is where the stool is and the stool is probably the the best place for atheists because the angry god people are moving away from that angry god and don't believe in that god well we don't believe in that god anymore either we're we're on the journey atheism is actually one of the best bridges to being ready for a better wider truth and so it's funny how you call it a stool sample <laughs> you know <laughs> you know because you're moving away from the crap yeah. and i thought that was very interesting and that's that's kind of where i'm seeing things but where are you seeing people um running towards deconstruction what what, what kind of topics yeah, no i i don't i don't see anybody running towards deconstruction i see most people nobody wants to deconstruct in my opinion, my observation, it, it happens to you. Mm. Now, obviously, you've somehow prepared, prepared for it because, you know, we're not victims here. Yeah. I think deconstruction is actually growth. We used to call it backsliding <laughs> or doubting God yeah, yeah. or betraying Christ or whatever. Uh, now we call it growth. It's, it's growth. I love the, that. Church, the church is awesome at helping us become grow up into about adolescence but then when we start to rebel and question authority that's when the church drops the ball because it doesn't want that um and and then that's when we either stop questioning or the only way we can continue to question is by leaving so we um i i see two kinds of deconstruction one is theological and the other is ecclesiological mm. some people deconstruct from the church they've become disillusioned with the church, with its leadership, with its control, with its uh, greed, um, with its uh, exclusion of certain people, with its abuse, and, and they leave the church. But they may not deconstruct theologically at all. Mm. Uh, now, if somebody deconstructs theologically, they ought most often deconstruct ecclesiologically as well. Yeah. So I, I see both of those movements happening. The people I'm most concerned about are people who are deconstructing theologically uh, because that's, that's very, very traumatizing and there's no help out there. So your group is a safe group for people that are on that journey of deconstruction. Is yeah. that what you're saying? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Is, that, is that open for others to join in? Yes, absolutely. Yeah, the, the lastingsupper.com is where it's at. Okay. Um, uh, it's, uh, it's $15 a month, um, because it takes a lot of time and work to run the thing. Plus it's a kind of a barrier of entry. Uh, it's very safe from trolls and people who <laughs> just want to stir up trouble. And, uh, so it's, uh, and people are very grateful to be able to pay that to, for that safe space. So, um, but yeah, so, so deconstruction theologically, anything's up for grabs or everything's up for grabs. Yeah. You can't say, I'm, I'm deconstructing now, but I will never give up on my Jesus <laughs> and I will never give up on God. Well, no, sorry. You know, it's the whole meal deal. You, everything's yeah. going to, when, when you start deconstruction, everything's going to come to question. I'm not saying you're going to become an atheist or an agnostic. You might become an even better believer one day. Who knows? You cannot predict where you're going to end up. Mm. Fast your seatbelt. That's control try otherwise, right? Ride, try to enjoy the ride. <laughs> and you'll, wherever you end up, you'll be glad you're there. I had a really good buddy of mine. I met him about seven or eight years ago. And uh, when I met him, um, he, was, he walked in my office and um, he said, I'm just here to shoot the shit about Jesus with you. That's it. And he described his, his crisis of his own life. He said, I don't know what to believe anymore. You know, I, I don't believe any of this stuff anymore. And then he, he said, but, but then something hit me. Jesus, that's it. It's all I can believe. Nothing else. There's, everything else is, is up for grabs now. And he didn't even know what Jesus meant at that time. He didn't want to just stick with his traditional upbringing. But the journey of coming to the place of just open, mm -hmm. that just changed that guy. And I've never seen anybody with a more authentic faith. Like, mm -hmm. Incredible. He taught me a lot. <laughs> you know, it was really quite powerful. Mm -hmm. so, oh man.
yeah, he's a, he's a good guy. And I think when you have those kinds of relationships where you can be honest and, and talk through faith without sounding religious, that's why he, you know, the free language is, is swearing, you know, I'm not yeah. into the overt swear just to shock people, but it's not yeah. about the language. This is about real authentic conversation, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah, no, I, I talk with people every day. This is what I do. Uh, I help people deconstruct and but my, I'm not, I make this absolutely clear. I'm not trying to lead you anywhere. What I'm trying to do is, is allow you to empower yourself to become self-directing, mm-hmm. to become spiritually independent, I call it. People, when I started using that word spiritually independent, they're like, we're, we're not supposed to be independent. We're supposed to be in fellowship with one another. I'm saying, no, there's a difference <laughs> yes, there between is. being isolated and being independent. Yep. I'm an, an independent, hopefully, I'm, I've grown up to be an independent human being. Hopefully Lisa's grown up to be an independent human being and we choose to become interdependent. Mm, that's, if, that's more beautiful right there. If, if I, if I'm not independent of I'm codependent, that creates a toxic kind of a relationship. So didn't, didn't I, Stephen, didn't Stephen Covey talk about that too? In a couple of his books, in his leadership books on, it's not about independence. We think independence is the goal. Um, and we think dependence is subversive and low on the totem pole, but interdependence, interdependence. Is, is life. But it requires independence on the part of each person. I, yeah. I choose to be interdependent. If, if I'm in a toxic relationship where I feel needy and the other person's needy and it's this kind of codependent dependency kind of thing, mm-hmm. it's very sick and unhealthy and prevents growth. So, um, You know, I just encourage people, you need to start trusting yourself. Mm -hmm. And and yes, you can have mentors, you can have guides, you can have spiritual directors, you can have pastors and so on. But you you just don't, you're not like a a a baby bird in a nest just taking whatever they shove down your throat. Yeah. You you discern, is this good for me? Is this bad for me? It's like a diet. You you learn what's good for you, what's bad for you, or exercise. And, and, um, and it's the same with your spiritual life. You, it's, it's like uh, Nelson Mandela, right? Um, I am the master of my destiny, the captain of my ship kind of thing. Um, and it's, it's, it's the same for each one of us spiritually. One of the cartoons that I think seems to sell the most of your stuff or the, the your, uh, clothes that you sell, whatever, the hats, the shirts, is the, the one with questions are greater than the answer. Is that, oh, yeah. is that one of the top ones? Yeah, it's one of my most popular ones. Yeah. Okay. Question mark, greater than sign and exclamation. All right. Explain that because that seems to describe you and what you're doing in all the <laughs> yeah. philosophy of your cartoons. Help me understand yeah. that one. Yeah, questions are greater than answers. Um, I, in fact, I have a whole book uh, titled uh, Questions Are the Answer. Oh, good. How many books yeah. have you written then? Nine. <laughs> okay. I'll give you, a, uh, yeah. give you a moment at the end to tell me about your books, but tell me about I will. Okay. So yeah. questions are the answer. If, if you feel you have the answer, you're locked. You're locked in. You're done. But... If you are open to the questions and mystery and you're curious, that's where growth happens. That's where you expand. And, and um, so that's why I claim questions are greater than answers. And, you know, if you look at the gospel stories, Jesus was a master question, questioner. He, he knew how to ask questions. And even when he was asked a question, he'd answer with a question. <laughs> so it's like, um, if, if we can open up our, our minds to accept questions as a way to wisdom, um, I think we're well on our way to, to growth. Yeah. That's cool. I found your, I found the cover. So there's the, yeah, the book cover. And there, look, uh, Brad Jerzak gives me the, uh, a recommendation at the bottom. Oh, oh, cool. <laughs> Gary Larson meets Jeremiah. Gary Larson is the far side. Guy. <laughs> yeah, I love, listen, I love the far side. <laughs> so my really latest cool. book, my latest book is Till Doubt Do Us Part. When Changing Beliefs Change Your Marriage. Ooh. And um, what if you're not married? Can you still order it? Absolutely. If you're dating or even, this even applies to family relationships. If, if what, you're. What's it called? When Doubts? Till Doubt Do Us oh. Part. 
T I L. Yep. D O U B T. Till doubt do. Okay, keep going. Tell us about that book. Yeah, so it, it's, uh, I, you know, Lisa and I, when we went through deconstruction, our marriage went through a real major strain and um, we made it. A lot of marriages don't make it. Um, so when beliefs change in your marriage, either yours or your spouse's or both, often it causes a lot of tension in the relationship and many marriages blow up. So I, I wrote this book to help people um, find ways to maybe stay together or if they feel they need to go separate ways to do it in a healthy way. And um, so I, that's why I wrote the book. And there's, I don't know, something like 30 chapters and a, a whack of cartoons in there. And it's on Amazon and Kindle. Yep. So yeah, I just posted the picture here. So yep. it looks good. Dope. Yep. I love the cover, eh? The two that's really cool. And the question mark. Oh! Again. oh, that's good. I never caught that. Sorry. <laughs> that's, that's cool. So that's not just for married folks. This can be for those that are also questioning doubt, you know, have doubts, right? That's right. Or is it primarily for relationships? Cause people are going to wonder. Well, no, it's primarily for relationships. Now I have other books. Like I mentioned, uh, I have another book, the lasting supper letters for deconstruction, oh, which okay. is all about deconstruction and questions are the answer. That's another book that would be helpful. Uh, especially maybe uh, for people who are deconstructing and asking questions, but also for pastors, because it's basically my story mm. about leaving, being in the ministry and then leaving the ministry and all that. So, Okay. So you grew up where? New Market area, you said? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, not far from you. Yeah. That's all right. right. And then now you're living where? Quispam Sis, New Brunswick, just outside of St. John. <laughs> okay. Very cool. So it's like uh, 11 o'clock where you are almost, right? That's right. All right. That's right. Yeah. Well, we're going to wrap this up. I, I, I want to thank you for this time. This was really fun. A fellow yeah. Canadian. And uh, this topic is huge. And there's a lot of people hungry to learn more. Uh, they don't know where, it's, uh, where a safe place is to deconstruct. They know they want to question things, right. but you can't in the church system. So I think this is exciting. And the more, more they're exposed to good people like you, I think let's, let's keep this going. So. Yeah, so to your listeners out there um, or watchers, uh, uh, you know, if you go to nakedpastor.com, you can sign up for my email, but I'm really good at responding. Uh, if you message me on Facebook or Twitter or Instagram or whatever, I'm really good at answering. So if you have any questions or anything you'd like to ask me or talk about, just reach out to me. I'm really good at getting back to you. That's awesome. All right, yeah. I'm going to sign off, but I'll talk to you for okay, just a moment as soon as I turn off the off part here. And uh, thank you again, everyone, for uh, joining us today. I hope you enjoyed the conversation with David. And go to his uh, Facebook page, look at the cartoons, his nakedpastor.com, I think it is, or is yep. it CA.com. Um, there's a lot of great stuff there, and it'll get you thinking. It'll, it'll make you laugh, which is great therapy right now during COVID. Um, but uh, just go take a look at that. Thanks again, David. And okay. we're going to sign off officially. Bye, everyone by clicking this off button. Alrighty, I hope you enjoyed that. That was a longer conversation, but uh, still really good. And to meet a fellow Canadian who's um, already walked through many, many questions and is still on a journey of unlearning and discovering the mystery, uh, I love that. So anyway, I hope that was encouraging to you. I hope that uh, um, gives you more permission to keep asking questions. And uh, there are people you can connect with. Um, Hope Fellowship is one. Uh, Growing Grace Canada is, is another. Um, we're connected at the hip. But there are many others across Canada and the United States, around the world. Um, yeah, anyway, it's let's keep growing together. I love this. That's all I got for today. Uh, I got to run. I hope that was encouraging to you, and we'll, we'll, we'll catch you next time for the next conversation. See you then. Join me next time on Still Growing in Grace for more good news. Enjoy previous episodes by downloading our podcast at growingingrace.ca. You can also visit hopefellowshipycc.com to find our service times and location. If this show has been an encouragement to you, please consider making a donation today at growingingrace.ca and help us keep spreading this good news. Thank you again for tuning in to Still Growing in Grace.